Hi everyone. So today we're going to be talking all about pH as it relates to your plants and more specifically how pH can have negative effects on your plants. Now I do want to start off stating up front that the odds of something you see going wrong with your plants being pH related is pretty slim you guys. Nine times out of ten it is probably something else causing that issue. So I highly recommend that you always rule out every other possible issue, pests, whatever it may be, bad lighting, who knows, whatever abundance of things it could possibly be before you jump to the conclusion that it is a pH related issue. However, if you are able to rule everything out, then this would be the last thing for you to figure out. So that's why I wanted to do this video for you guys today. So why is pH important? pH is important because pH is what determines the bioavailability of nutrients in our soils for our plants. So most of the time we look at, for example, nutrient deficiencies in plants and automatically you might think, oh, it's because it doesn't have enough of X, Y, Z, nutrient, mineral, whatever it may be. But that's usually not the case. Usually it's not that you haven't been giving it enough nutrients unless you haven't been fertilizing at all. And then yes, it would be that case. But if you have been fertilizing on a regular basis, it's not that you aren't giving it enough, it's that the pH is off. And because the pH is off, the plant is unable to attain those nutrients and use them. So I'm gonna explain that a little bit more in detail here now, but I do wanna let you guys know that I have notes I will be referencing today because it's a lot and I'm trying to keep it scientifically simple for you guys, but in doing so, I wanna make sure that I don't miss anything. So I figured referencing notes would be a good way to go today. So the first thing that you guys need to know is the ideal range for most houseplants. There are always going to be some plants that are outliers that really like, for example, a more acidic environment to grow in. There's going to be perhaps even some who really want a more alkaline than most to grow in. But for most of your houseplants, that ideal range for the pH is going to be between a 6 and a 7. Now, that being said, if your soil does go a little bit higher than that, let's say like a 7.5 or a little bit lower than that, like a 5.5, you're still gonna be okay. It's not like the ideal, ideal range, but you're typically not going to see crazy amounts of problems if you get a little bit outside of that six to seven range. So just keep that in mind. Now, what exactly happens when pH gets out of whack? And I'm talking if it gets massively out of whack. Well, part of the reason we want that ideal six to seven range for our houseplants is because that range provides the greatest level of bioavailability of nutrients to our plant's roots. And I also wanna point out right now, you guys, that the way you probably think about a plant obtaining nutrients from the soil and from like fertilizers that we fertilize our plants with is, is probably not 100% accurate. The roots themselves are not like seeking out and pulling those nutrients in, if you will the water that we put into our soil, it attracts those nutrients and carries those nutrients to the roots where the nutrients are then taken from the roots, absorbed and delivered to the parts of the plant that need it. So because water is the delivery system, nutrients have to be water soluble in order to be able to incorporate with that water and be taken to the roots. And once again, I'm gonna try not to get too sciencey here, but basically what you need to know is it all kind of comes down to hydrogen ions, basically. If we have an overabundance of hydrogen ions in the soil, that can cause a problem. If we have an underabundance, that can cause a problem because it directly affects the ability of certain compounds to attach to other compounds. So for example, for water to be able to take something and carry it to those roots, we need a balance of hydrogen ions in order for everything to work the way it should. And when we do have that balance, that also creates a balance of just ionic, ionic charge, if you will, in the soil that is more equal. So we have an equal amount of negatively charged ions and an equal amount of positively charged ions. So when those things get out of whack, that's when things go wrong. And the number one thing that goes wrong is something known as nutrient lockout. Now, I feel like I've probably mentioned nutrient lockout in a few videos before, but let's kind of go into it a little bit more here. So like I said, if there is too many hydrogen ions in the soil, when that happens, those hydrogen ions are actually taking up valuable spots in the soil where nutrients could be occupying those spots. So when that happens and you, for example, go to fertilize a plant, the fertilizer does not actually get solubilized if that's a word, but you know what I mean? It's not soluble enough 
to incorporate with that water for the water to deliver it to the plant. So basically the fertilizer just runs off. It gets like washed out of the soil or anything that's left behind potentially, depending on what it is, could just evaporate up out as the water is dried up in that soil. Now, on the flip side, if we don't have enough hydrogen ions in the soil, soil inherently wants to have a certain number of ions and a certain number of nutrients, if you will. So if there are not enough hydrogen ions, the soil has a tendency to lock down the nutrients it has access to, and it just kind of basically clings to them and will not let them go. So once again, it's insoluble to that water. It can't get into that water to be carried to those roots. The other problem here is if we have nutrient depleted soil, for example, it will sometimes be so desperate for nutrients and so desperate for the specific ions that it needs in order to get back into balance that it can actually pull certain things out of your plant because it needs them so badly. So that is why pH is really important because if we get out of whack like this, the nutrients just never get delivered to the plants and then we start to see problems with our plants. And I will explain signs and symptoms of these issues here in a bit. So let's talk about what kind of nutrient deficiencies can happen when things get out of whack. And I will be referencing my notes here because <laughs> I'm trying to remember all of these nutrients. I would probably forget one. So what kind of nutrient deficiencies happen when we have acidic soils? So acidic soils are anything that is under a seven on the pH scale. And the nutrients that are bioavailable in acidic soils are nitrogen, phosphorus, magnesium, potassium, sulfur, and calcium. So that is the six big ones. Now, the further down we get on the scale, so the lower below a seven we go, the more bio unavailable those nutrients become. And that's when you can start to see signs of deficiency in those specific nutrients. Now with super strongly acidic soils, so like we went way far down the pH scale, those soils can become overly abundant in aluminum, iron, and manganese, and that can cause problems as well. But guys, something is gonna be, I, I mean, I don't even, I can't even, well, I can't actually think of some things. Let's just say like if you had, for example, followed some of those weird recommendations, I'm sure you guys have seen popping up in like plant app ads where they're pouring, pouring like milk and soy sauce and other weird things into plants. Maybe if you tried something like that, you could trigger a change in the pH that would go that strongly acidic. But the normal things that you're doing taking care of your plants, your soil should never really get that overly acidic to where the aluminum, iron, and manganese are becoming a problem. Now, when it comes to alkaline soils, so these are soils that are testing on that pH scale with a seven or higher. These are the nutrients that are bioavailable at that end, and that is iron, magnesium, boron, copper, and zinc. Now, the higher we go on the pH scale, pH scale. So higher over seven we go, the more bio unavailable those nutrients will become. All right. So how do we avoid nutrient lockout? We avoid nutrient lockout by maintaining a nice balanced pH in our soil in that six to seven range. Once again, if you go like 0.5 outside either direction, you're still going to be okay. But ideally we're aiming for somewhere between six and seven. Now, in order to achieve and maintain ideal soil pH, we first need to understand the four main factors that can really adversely affect your soil pH. Number one I wanna talk about though is water. So the pH of your water can have an effect on your plants because you are potentially pouring something more acidic or more alkaline than the soil already is into the soil. And the more frequently a plant needs to be watered, the more often you're doing it, the greater the effect can be. So I want to take a second to talk about a couple things. Now, first of all, if the pH is off in your water, the nutrients that it can end up leaching away basically are calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium. These are very important ingredients to our plants. And sodium in particular, if it gets out of whack, can cause all kinds of problems. Calcium deficiency can cause tons of problems. Magnesium deficiency can cause tons of problems. So we really don't want that happening. So how do different types of water affect your pH? This is key. A lot of people don't think about this. We think about the things that are in our water that perhaps we don't like, like heavy metals, chlorine, chloramine. We'll talk about those last two here a bit more in a second, but we don't really think about the pH and what happens when we try to remove certain things from our water 
to the pH. So I want to talk first about what is called dead water. There are two types of what is referred to as dead water or perhaps neutral water. So distilled water is the first one because we hear a lot of people saying like water your plants with distilled water so that you don't get like brown leaf tips. It's a highly recommended thing for like prayer plant, family plants in, in general, like highly, it comes up a lot in things you read online. Once again, don't always trust everything you read online. I have experimented with distilled water in the past. I didn't really see a difference, so I stopped doing it. But another thing to be aware of with distilled water is it, it is called dead water because it has no nutrient value in it whatsoever. Your tap water does have minerals in it. Distilled water does not. It also affects the ion charge in the water. Theo, stop it, please. All right, sorry you guys, he was latching onto the tripod and like, I don't know, like he was gonna play with it or something, but I think we're good to go now. So like I was saying, distilled water has no minerals, no nothing in it, but because of that, it actually is more attracted to the minerals and nutrients that are already in your soil, and it will try to leach them out of the soil and bring them into the water, if you will. Now, because it is distilled and it has had all this stuff removed, distilled water tends to be on the slightly more acidic side. So when you are watering with that, not only are you adding more acid, if you will, to your plant's soil and potentially decreasing that pH number to a more acidic level, but keep in mind what I just said, you also are probably just inherently losing nutrients because the water is trying to pull them back out because it's lost all of its nutrients in the distilling process. Now, similar to that is reverse osmosis water. A lot of you have asked me, can I water with reverse osmosis water? The answer is yes. And I probably should mention this now, you guys. I'm not saying that any of these water types that we're talking about right now are bad per se for your plants, but you just need to keep in mind the effects that it can have on your pH and your plant's ability to get the nutrients that it needs. So reverse osmosis water is basically deionized water. Now, like distilled water, it is a form of dead water. It does not have its minerals in it. It is also often referred to as neutral water because it's been deionized, but because of that, you're gonna have the same issue you, you do with distilled water. It is gonna be a bit more on the acidic side and it is gonna have a tendency to wanna to pull those nutrients out of that soil and attach to them and hang on to them. So this is not what I was talking about earlier with solubility, where it's like, okay, it's going to take those nutrients and it's gonna carry them to the roots. It's gonna take those nutrients and it's going to hang on to them because it wants them back basically. Okay, spring water, because I know some people get the big spring water, bottle water things and have a dispenser, and I know some of you guys use that. So spring water, good news is it already has minerals, so it's not going to be trying to pull the minerals back out of the soil. However, it does have a tendency to be a bit more alkaline, so it is likely to push your pH number up if you're using spring water, the extent to which it's going to do that really just depends. Not all spring water is created equally. And we will talk here in a bit about how to figure out exactly what the pH situation is with your water. Now, rainwater. Lots of people say, well, rainwater is what plants get water with outside and it works for them, so it must be good. You gotta remember, outside environment is a little bit different. The nutrients in the soil are a little bit more abundant. There's all kinds of different things happening outside, like there's bugs and insects living in the soil and they're creating different compounds and pro chemical processes and everything. It's just different. It's designed to work together, right? Rainwater is designed to work with everything that is happening outside in your garden soil, for example. When we have potted soil, we don't have all that same kind of activity processes, creatures in the soil going on. So it's not going to work exactly the same. Now, rainwater inherently does not have any minerals, you guys. So to a certain extent, you're going to have the same issue that you do with distilled water or reverse osmosis water. However, you have to keep in mind too that rainwater, the quality of your rainwater and the pH of your rainwater is going to be highly dependent on environmental conditions. So for example, pollution from cars, exhaust from cars that's in the air. If it's raining, it's intermingling with that rain and it is combining, I believe it's sulfuric acid, sorry, sulfur dioxides and nitrogen oxides that are produced from the cars on the road, that mixes in with rainwater and causes it to become more acidic. I'm sure you've all heard of acid rain. 
Acid rain is an example of when this gets like supercharged out of hand. And with acid rain, like the number, the common value for pH of typical acid rain is a four. That is highly acidic, you guys. So rainwater sounds great in theory, but could cause a super big issue in terms of shifting your pH. So that leaves us with filtered tap water or just regular tap water. Regular tap water and filtered tap water are gonna have minerals. So you're not gonna have those problems that I discussed before with the water trying to pull the minerals out of the soil. Now, filtered tap water typically is better than unfiltered tap water, why? Because of chlorine and chloramine. We all have probably heard of chlorine and chloramine and oh my gosh, it's bad for your plants before, but is it really bad, you guys? Is it really? We're gonna talk about that in a second. But what you need to know as far as pH goes with tap water, everybody's tap water is gonna be a little bit different depending on where you live and how they process it. You could have slightly more alkaline tap water or you could have slightly more acidic tap water. The only way you're gonna know for sure is to actually test it. Once again, we'll discuss that more in a bit. But with filtered tap water, what is nice about filtered tap water is you can have already removed chlorine and chloramines versus unfiltered tap water. I know some of you have probably heard you can let it sit out overnight, let it sit 24 hours and the chlorine will go away. That's not wrong, you guys. Chlorine is, it becomes a gas again. So basically it evaporates itself off out of the water. However, chloramine does not. The only way you're gonna get chloramine out is with a carbon filter. That is why I have always watered my plants with filtered water just from my fridge with the carbon filter that's attached in, or not attached, like set inside of my fridge for the water dispenser on the outside of my fridge. That is my preference. And I have found that it has worked well for my plants. Now, chlorine and chloramine. All right, make sure I tell you guys correctly. Here's the question. Is chlorine even really harmful for your plants? Because a lot of people say it is, but I got curious. So there are multiple studies that have been done on this, by the way, but there was a study conducted where they used 100 parts per million on plants and the plants were just fine, you guys. They were just fine. They did not have any issues. There was another study done where they used even more. They used 150 parts per million for 50 days. And then they let the plants rest for two days, not getting watered with water with, with the chlorine, the 150 parts per million. And the composition, when they tested it after two days of letting it be, had already corrected itself back to normal. So even though it did have a slight effect, it did not create any kind of harmful anything that was obvious in the plants. And then after two days, the soil was tested and it was 100% back to normal. So this whole like huge thing around chlorine and ooh, chlorine is scary and whatnot is a little bit blown out of proportion. But once again, if you can get it out of the water, why not get it out of the water? Now, some of you have mentioned to me before about using water conditioner to treat your water in order to get heavy metals, chlorine and chloramine out of your tap water to use it on your plants. You can do that. In my research, there is not a big problem with that. Just recognize that that can though shift your pH. So you're gonna need to test and kind of see what happens when you use that. The big question mark I have for that though, you guys, is how does that affect fertilizer? So I have not been able to find a solid answer on that. I looked and looked and looked, and it's just my one big question mark is if we are treating it with something that's supposed to pull bad things out, what is that compound and how is it pulling things out? It must be attaching to molecules to remove them. And once again, we've been discussing so far today that molecules attaching or not attaching to other molecules due to ion imbalances in your soil cause a problem. So that is my only word of caution. And maybe it's the water with that. Theo, now it's the mic stand he's trying to attack. I may have to remove him from the room in a second. But what I was saying was it may be a situation where perhaps if you wanna go that route of using a water conditioner that you just use it when you don't fertilize. And then when you do fertilize, just use regular tap water that you've let sit out or filter tap water so that you don't have to risk something going wrong when you're adding fertilizer to that. Okay, so back to our other factors that can affect our pH. So when we have decomposition, decomposition within the soil, CO2 is released and that can also change the pH of your soil. In addition to that, any kind of day, 
I can talk today, you guys. Decaying organic material in the soil releases nitric acid, it can release sulfuric acid, etc. And that can also shift your soil to being more acidic. So for example, if we have natural like root die off happening on a plant, or if you have leaves falling off of your plant onto the surface of the soil and those are dying off, that kind of thing can affect the pH of your soil. Okay, also roots respire just like leaves respire. Now, when they do this though, they release a weak acid. So just your plant living its happy natural life is going to produce an acid that is going to potentially make that soil more acidic over time. Now it's not gonna be a huge, huge shift, but the longer a plant is in a pot, the more it may become noticeable. This is also a good time to point out that this is also why it's probably good practice to repot your plants, even if they are not like, crazy in need of it. Sometimes you want to repot them anyway every few years just to get a soil refresh so that you don't have this old soil that's gotten out of whack hanging out making issues for your plants. Okay next thing we need to think about or the last thing in our four major factors is fertilizer. So when we do use fertilizer oxidation of ammonium sulfate happens and over time that can become an accumulative type of effect and cause the soils to become more acidic as well. All right, so how do we know if we have a pH issue is the next question. Well, two things. First of all, signs and symptoms. If you have a plant, for example, and I will say right now, you guys, it sounds like more often than not, based on what I've been telling you, right, every these all these factors that I'm telling you tend to be because something is putting more acid into the soil. So most often, if your soil pH is off, it's gonna to be too acidic. It's gonna be a rare situation that it is probably gonna to be too high on the alkaline side. So let's talk about symptoms, signs and symptoms of low soil pH, AKA soil is too acidic. So first of all, stunted growth. Second of all, brown spots on leaves, and this is usually because the soil has become so acidic that there's now a calcium deficiency happening in your plants. Dying leaves, of course. Green leaves with red or purple edges that shouldn't have red or purple edges. Burnt leaf tips, just looking withered, twisted, deformed leaves, and then chlorotic leaves. So chlorotic meaning they've started to lose their color, they're looking duller, they're looking yellower, things like that. But once again, you guys, remember, a lot of other things can cause everything I just described in a plant. So always rule out everything else first before you jump to, it's a nutrient issue, it's a pH issue, I need to figure out what's going on here. Okay, so on the flip side, signs and symptoms of too high of a soil pH, so AKA overly alkaline soil, are honestly some of the same as with overly acidic soil. So stunted and or wilted leaves, brown spots on the leaves, chlorotic leaves, and then tip death. Where, where the new leaves are supposed to be coming in, they keep just dying off and not coming in. But once again, make sure we rule out everything else that could be the problem before we jump to that conclusion. And then also green leaves with red or purple edges that shouldn't have red or purple edges is also a indication that it could be too alkaline. So how do we know, since a lot of these symptoms are the same, how do we know if it is overly acidic that's causing it or if it's overly alkaline that is causing it? Well, the only way to do that is to test the pH and not only of your soil, but also of your water. I highly recommend that you do both if you think you have an issue. So soil testing methods. The best method out there would be to send it off to a lab that actually knows what they're doing and can look at it and give you a full analysis. But I mean, you would have to like take a sample of soil out of every single pot in your house and I don't even want to think about how much that would cost. So there are kits that you can buy to test your soil and your water at home. So let's talk about water first. And I do have test kits that I have linked below in my Amazon storefront link that is in the description of every video on my channel. So you can quickly go there and get the ones I use if you want. But basically I bought a pH testing strip set for my water that not only shows the pH, but also shows the level of various minerals and things in the water too, because I wanted to make sure that those weren't out of whack potentially as well. And lucky for me, when I tested my water, everything was actually pretty balanced. So that worked out well for me. So that means my water is good. It's not overly acidic. It's not overly alkaline. It's probably not causing a major issue. Now, remember, if you are using filtered water, 
Make sure you test your filtered water. Don't just take it straight from the tap if what you're watering your plants with is filtered water. If you're watering with spring water, make sure you're testing your spring water. If you're sometimes doing one, sometimes doing the other, test them all. There's plenty of test strips in the kit that I'm recommending and it's not that pricey. But how do we test our soil? So once we've determined, let's say that our water is okay, and I will explain what to do if your water is not okay in a second. If our water is fine and we wanna figure out, okay, well then is potentially my soil off? You're going to need to either get a test kit that is a take a sample of your soil, combine it with some things and find out the readings. And honestly, you guys, of the two options that I'm gonna to explain to you right now, this is gonna be the more reliable one. It's also gonna give you a greater data set to understand more of the specific things that might be off in your soil. But the other alternative, if you don't really wanna mess with that and you want something that's honestly a little bit easier, is a soil pH testing meter. Now, this is very similar to the water meters that a lot of people like to use, but let me explain to you about why I am not a huge fan of these water meters. And I'm gonna go ahead and say, I'm probably not gonna be a huge fan of the pH meters for the same reason. Number one is there's no way to calibrate these meters, none whatsoever. Number two is they work based on electric impulses or electric conductivity. That is the word I'm looking for, electric conductivity. So if the conductivity gets off in your soil, it can trigger a misreading. I'm just saying, you guys, I still am trying to work on an experiment to prove what I'm saying to you guys. It's just really hard. I, I do it and I'm like, it works. But then like scientifically, I'm like, can I poke holes in it? And I'm like, yes, I can poke holes in it. And I don't want to be able to poke any holes in it. So I'm still working on it. Hopefully I will have that video for you at some point in the future. But just know they can be a little bit unreliable. Honestly, the other test kit is the better option. But I went ahead and tested both for you. So with the probe, you're basically just gonna stick it down into the soil in your plant, get it pretty far down in there, let it sit for at least 10 seconds, and then check the reading. So here it's 6.5, which is good. Then if you're doing the other method, you're gonna to need to get an actual soil sample. So you wanna go at least a few inches down to get your soil sample. Make sure you're not just taking it off the top of the surface. And then once you've gotten enough, you're gonna let it sit out until it has completely dried out. Then you're gonna to want to grind that up or crumble it up till it is kind of a fine texture or consistency. Make sure that you remove any kind of like large particles like rocks or anything like that. Once you've done that, you're going to use a spoon to scoop and very carefully add that soil into the test chamber of the indicator device. You wanna make sure you just fill that up to the soil line indicator and then you're going to hopefully more carefully than me open up one of the green pills and put the activator powder into that chamber as well. And apologies for my essential trimmers, you guys. They were in overdrive. Plus I was a little nervous. I was gonna spill this all over the place trying to open it, but eventually I managed to get it all in there. Then you're going to fill that the rest of the way with water up to the water fill line. They did include this nice little pipette, which actually makes it a whole lot easier to get the water in there without making a mess. But once again, just keep going until you get it up to that fill line. And then once it is up to that fill line, you're just gonna grab the lid, put it on nice and tight, and then you're going to shake this vigorously in order to get all of that to combine together. Once you have gotten it all combined together, you're gonna set it somewhere for one full minute, somewhere where it can actually get some natural light is encouraged according to the instructions, and then you're gonna read it from there. So looking at this, I feel like that is probably around a six or maybe somewhere between 5.5 and six. Here's another look for you guys in more regular lighting as well, so you can see. So this test actually is telling me that the soil is slightly more acidic than what the probe was telling me, but we're still within range with both. Okay, so now you have tested your water, you have tested your soil, and you've discovered that some things are out of whack with one or both. What do you do? Okay, so let's talk about the water first. The water is honestly the easier fix. If you do find that the water you're using is overly acidic or overly alkaline, you can buy what is known as pH up 
or pH down to be able to shift it into that ideal six to seven range. These are super simple to find. You can order them on Amazon. I will, I don't think I have any in my store right now, but I will link before I release this video, link some pH up and pH down into my storefront for you. But also you can get this at pretty much any local pet store because people who have aquariums use pH up and pH down to get their aquarium water to the correct pH level for their fish. So definitely if you don't wanna have to wait and you want it today, you can run out to a pet store and simply get it. If your soil, or sorry, if your water is too alkaline, you want the pH down, and if it is too acidic, you want the pH up. Now, if we determine that our soil pH is off, it's honestly, I saw a lot of things you guys saying it's an easy fix. It's not an easy fix. I don't know. I, maybe if you're gardening, it's an easy fix because a lot of the people that are talking about soil pH being off and how to fix it out there are doing it for outdoor gardening. And when we're talking about massive dirt that's actually in the ground and not in a pot, yes, it might be a little bit easier to fix, but with potted plants, not so much. But I'm just gonna tell you what the fix is and then I'm gonna tell you the best way to potentially execute it. So if we do have pH that is too acidic, your best fix is lime. So when we're talking about lime as a fix for pH, you're gonna be looking at either calcite lime or dolomite lime. You do not want hydrated lime, not good for the plants. So what this does is it actually replaces hydrogen ions in your soil that are missing. And it actually does also add a little bit of calcium and magnesium back as well, which when we go to acidic, we do lose access bio bioavailability access to those two nutrients. Now here's the thing you guys, I read a few places from a few reliable sources, a soil scientist in Canada, and I mean, she's a soil scientist, she should know what she's talking about. It was talking about like you can sprinkle a little bit of it on the top of a potted plant and then just water it in. But even the way she was describing it was like, it needs to be a sprinkle, a sprinkle, not a layer, not like a dusted layer. And I was like, that's just kind of confusing. And then she went on further to say, if you can actually incorporate it into the soil, it would be better. And pretty much everything I read was like, it really needs to be fully incorporated into the soil to really do the best job that it can. And that's not gonna happen unless you completely repot the plant. And that is kind of where I'm going with this is most of these fixes are really gonna require you to actually fully repot the plant and use new soil. Because the easiest way for you to modify your soil if it is too acidic is to take a new bag of soil and incorporate lime into that bag thoroughly. So this brings me to another point. A lot of us, well, I'm gonna say, we shouldn't be using just straight plain old potting soil with no amendments in it whatsoever straight out of the bag. It's gonna to be too dense for our plants. So we are typically adding something, even if it's just perlite to our soil and that can have an effect on the pH. So what I highly recommend doing before you start going crazy with, I gotta repot my plants, I need to add lime to this, I need to do whatever I need to do to fix this problem. I would recommend mixing up a batch of your actual soil that you're using on the plant in question and testing a whole brand new batch of that to see what a new batch's pH is. So if you do that and the pH level is normal, well then your solution might just be, I need to repot this plant into a fresh batch of my substrate that I use. And problem solved until like a year or so down the line when it will have probably gotten out of whack again and you might need to do a soil refresh repot again. Now, if you do mix up your mix and it turns out it is overly acidic to begin with, that's when you would want to add lime in. Now, how much lime you use depends, you guys, because it depends on your reading. So you're going to have to add some lime, mix it in, test it again, add a little more, mix it in, test it again to get it to where it needs to be. But a good rule of thumb that I was coming across when I was researching this video for you guys was a average normal size bag of potting soil, for example, you would add one cup of lime to that. And then if it was a bigger bag, you would add a little bit more. If it was a smaller bag, you would add a little bit less, but always just err on the side of caution. And then you're gonna have to repeatedly test it to see if you've resolved the issue. I know it sounds like a pain in the butt, you guys, but the good news is, like I said at the start of this video, the odds that the problem you're seeing is pH related is pretty slim unless things have just gone crazy or you're using some kind of soil amendment that I've never used or have no experience with. So just don't get intimidated or freaked out here. And nine times out of 10, I'm guessing a fresh 
backs fresh batch of your substrate is probably gonna be in the okay range unless once again, you are using some crazy amendment that's just gonna have some massive pH swing to it. Okay, let me make sure I didn't forget anything in regards to fixing the soil if it's too acidic. I did not. Okay, so how do we fix it if it's too alkaline? Honestly, this is more complicated. So sulfur. Sulfur is your fix if it's too alkaline in order to make the soil more acidic. However, first of all, elemental sulfur is the sulfur that you're gonna to wanna to use. There is another type of sulfur you can use, but it is more highly more expensive and elemental will work. It might work a little bit slower than the other type, but honestly, they both work slow. And this is the problem with using sulfur on soil that is overly alkaline to fix it. So what happens is the bacteria in the soil actually changes that sulfur to sulfuric acid, which lowers the pH of the soil, makes it more acidic, which is what we need. However, in order for this to happen, A, your soil needs to be moist and the temperature needs to be above 55 and it is a crazy slow process. So unlike with the lime where you could just mix it into your soil and then test your soil again, almost right away, I'd probably like, you know, let it sit for at least an hour or so to incorporate in before you retest perhaps. But with this, that's not gonna happen. It's not gonna be an immediate change. It's not a chemical process. And because it's not a chemical process, you can't test right away. So it makes things a little bit more complicated. Now, once again, the good news is most of the time, alkalinity is not our problem. Most of the time, overly acidic soil is our problem. So yeah, hopefully we won't have to be doing this, but if we do, it's just gonna take a while. This is gonna be one of those things where you're just gonna have to once again, mix up your substrate, test it. If it is naturally too alkaline, you're just gonna have to play around with sulfur. You're gonna have to let that batch you mixed up sit there for like a week or so and just go back and test it and see if it's changed. If it hasn't changed at all, then the process hasn't happened fully yet. So just wait till you see that change, maybe wait a few more days after that to make sure it's not still changing. And then if it's still too alkaline, you've got to add more sulfur and wait again. I did not find anywhere, you guys, that really suggested there was a good way to add sulfur directly into a potted plant. So once again, this is going to require like a complete repot with the soil that you have adjusted using the sulfur. Okay, so after talking about all of this, you might be like, oh my gosh, I'm so like, <laughs> this does not sound fun. And maybe you've tested your soil and you're like, I don't want to have to deal with all of this. There are some home remedies out there, you guys. I'm sure some of you have heard about people watering their plants with the diluted leftovers from their coffee cup because coffee is acidic and that can increase the acidity in your soil if it is too alkaline. There are people who talk about using baking soda to make adjustments to pH. Once again, though, you guys, it's just like I was saying earlier, like where we see all these crazy weird ads where it's the apps and it's like, what's wrong with my plant? Take a picture. And then it's like, water it with milk, put chili powder in it, water it with soy sauce. I really believe those ads are really just designed to get your attention. But the problem is a lot of people who don't know better might actually go out and do that. And there's a lot of people online who have written blogs and things where they suggest doing that. You don't know if these people have actually tested this. They could have just heard about it from somebody else who knows. I'm just going to leave it at this, you guys. Use home remedies at your own risk, but maybe just test it first to see if it's actually even going to change the pH significantly. So once again, mix up some of your substrate, just not out of your plant. Don't do it directly in your plant, basically. Or you could take some soil out of your plant and do a combination of diluted coffee and water and pour it over the soil, let it sit for a bit and then test it and see if it worked or not. It will tell you, first of all, if it's actually changing the pH and if it's getting it to the level you need it to be. But then you gotta think, is this actually going to be okay for my plant? I just, for me, you guys, home remedies are kind of a little bit of a weird thing. It has been scientifically proven, for example, that adding eggshells to your plants does not actually significantly increase the calcium for your plants, which is the reason that people do it. You just gotta take these things with a grain of salt. So I would, if you do have a serious pH issue with your soil, I would try to adjust it and you find that your fresh batch of your substrate has that pH issue as well. I would try to adjust it using the lime or the sulfur like I talked about. But lots of times you guys, you're just gonna mix up a fresh batch and find out that the pH is fine or maybe it's just slightly out of wax. So like I said before, where it's just like 0.5 too high, like 7.5 or 5.5, which would be 0.5 too low for the ideal range. 
And that's not really anything to worry about, you guys. It's not gonna cause a huge issue with your plants. But that is basically all I have for you guys today on pH and your plants. I hope you guys have found this video helpful. If so, please be sure to click that like and or subscribe button down below. And I look forward to seeing you guys again next time. Aloha.